Nope, we're good. Okay, I have contact back from Raffle. ETA is within three minutes, so... That drop is going to be 2222, two, 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 which is two assaults, two heavies, two mediums, two lights. No matter which way you look at it, I still believe my way is right. But, top down. Uh, and that's going to be on Tourmaline Desert. It's a hot map, so... ER large laser snipers, if you can pin them down, or just snipers in general, if you can pin them down, they're going to have a hard time bringing the sustained DPS. However, at the same time, Tourmaline Desert has a lot of uh, valleys and cliffs that are hard to assault up into. Uh, F7 for one, there's also a position... Let's bring up the map. There's <laughs> also a position... There, there's three or four different positions you can go into that are hard to assault. And yes, I hear you got your guys' requests for more first-person view. I'll try and do that for the next match. Okay, so the main the main point that we've seen actually a couple teams use is F7. Uh, this sort of pocket area here is hard to assault, and you've got pretty much a way to flex out no matter what. The reason that is is because the valley in here uh, is basically unapproachable. So you have to approach from the far north or the far north or the far south here in H6. Either way you come from, they have the option to escape the other way. On the other side, a position we've seen uh, CSJ use before, you can use uh, this pocket in F4, and you just slide back and forth using the, the hill, this sort of half ridge here, to isolate half the, half the force, and you get long sight lines out to about, I believe it's 800 meters, uh, just all through there depending on your exact positioning, and you can win trades like that. Other positions that are not so good, but potential for camping, are C6, C7, over in here. The reason why that's not so good is, like we saw in the last match at the end, your back is getting pretty close to being up against the wall. Your escape routes are not as quality. Uh, we've seen teams play a ring around the rosy in D3, D4, E4, drawing over here, and not in comp play, but I have seen in the 12-man queue teams turtle up uh, in the back here. And again, back against the wall, escape routes are going to be shut down a little. But in any case, we have word that the next match is about to start, so let's get in there. Okay. Ooh. 228 has brought two Banshee 3Ms, two Cataphract 3Ds, two Generefs, interesting choice on this map since it's pretty hot, I figured you'd go with an Ember, and two Shadowhawks, one 2K and one 2D2. It's Pandy in the Shadowhawk 2 2K, probably reprising his role as 3ER large. And, ooh, some subs happening here for CSJ, Trey O'Neill coming in in the Spider 5D. 
they're going to go with more of a standard loadout with two Dragon Slayers. Well, they brought the ER Larger Laser Quick Draws again, a pair of those, and a pair of Shadowhawks. So, CSJ sticking to what they know. Tight oh, tight end. Gotta stop pooking, man. Let's have a look at what he's doing. Yeah, that's a CT down the about 7 or 8 armor left in the opening minute of the game. So CSJ is sitting back here, like uh, like I was saying, in that sort of uh, E4 sort of setup they like. But 228 has set up back here on what we call the stage, and they're moving up to hit this already. Panic button, the Banshee, Pandy, and Raffle up here in Shadowhawks already. Uh, the rest of 228's team just uh, filtering in a bit. A bit staggered, but nothing too terribly uh, disadvantageous. CSJ seeing this, they're going to start falling back from E4, just try and pull range, perhaps slide more towards the, the gully here, but they're going to stay up. They're going to stay up, and they're going to continue taking shots where they can. Downside to this is with those Dragon Slayers, they're, they're most commonly running an XL engine, 75 uh, kilometers an hour, and with Banshee 3Ms, Banshee 3Ms. Oh, holy shit. 3Ms are the energy one. This is not, uh... Oh god, what do you call it? The meta Banshee, where you're running 3 AC5s and uh, 2 PVCs. This guy is, is 7 medium pulses. And this is... This is something new. This is something I would more expect to see out of a light deck, but... We brought it. And 228 is just chilling out at the same time. CSJ is also chilling out just back here on... God, camera. Freaking tourmalines. Uh, just kind of an impasse here. Because with those Banshees being 7 million pulse, they don't have the range to continually trade. And you don't want to trade with Banshees anyways. Uh, you're big, you're slow, you're an easy target. You don't have jump jets. I feel like 228 at the moment, they're mentally pinned down. They haven't really got any sort of answers, any sort of intentions here. Uh, CSJ, on the other hand, they definitely do. They're swinging around, uh, getting guys up high, trying to create shots. Now they're going to be pushing in. Just trying to reestablish their distance after 228 has gone back to this tourmaline. I think if this continues to just, like, one team pushes up, what, the other falls back, then that team falls back and the other pushes up, it's it's probably CSJ's favor. But I can't really make predictions, it's too early in here. Other than Panic Button, down to 76% in that Banshee, uh, just getting caught out. Raffle Waffle as well, just a little stuck over here on the side. But 228 is committing in, they're committing in for this full push, CSJ sees it coming, they're running, they are... Just dropping back best they can. It was scouted by... Oh god, probably just their entire team seeing this. I'm gonna hop into a first person view that you all guys are all asking for. Here is the Raffle Waffle in an ERP... <sighs> ERPPC AC20, that's hot. And CSJ is sitting back, they've got a good firing line established. Oh, Panic Button is down to 64%, he's around the corner to the right, he's trying to get in here for his range. The rest of the 228 team is sitting back, this isn't a full push, That they're not fully committed, 49%, and their lead elements are dropping quickly. They need to get in here, they need to catch this. And I feel like they, just drop deck wise, like, if you had brought SRM Brawlers, they're going to be running faster than these Ballistic Brawlers there. Ballistic Brawlers are only going to be, like right here, we see it, 81 kph, but out of the SRMs, you're going to be going like 100-ish, catching these guys. And there are definitely some uh, SRMs from 228 side, but they have caught uh, Charlie, Dragon Slayer, uh, Zelkai Fury, and they're going to bring him down, but they're already down two, Panic Button in the, and Shredhead, pa Panic Button was a Banshee, that's a lot of tonnage, and Green's down 65% as well. Uh, whereas the rest of CSJ is still pretty healthy, but it is turning into a full brawl here. Now the question is, do they have enough to pull this out? But they're down four. They're down four. Seven are fresh for CSJ. I think the answer is no. Let's hop in. Let's keep popping in here. 
again, here, here's the thing about Jenners. They're running six medium lasers. They're hot. Um, lots of punch. But now your DPS is going to taper off severely. And they've dropped two. They've dropped a Dragon Slayer and a Shadowhawk. They've legged one of these quick draws. They gotta go through the left leg. Four of them left. Defunct is down. It's just Edmeester and Titanosis in the Jenner. Edmeester's overheated. Uh, Pandy. Pandy's Shadowhawk down the 47%. I don't think there's enough left here, guys. And again, another overheat out of the Jenner, and this time he doesn't get away with it. Last time he was 90%, he dropped to 85 This time he was 80% and he dropped to dead. So... Tynosis has lost an arm, and from earlier, his CT was already almost open. And that's going to come hurt him a little here. He's trying to go for the back on Leo in this quick draw, but he's going to be taken out before he gets it. And with that, CSJ takes game 3, 8-3 pulling ahead in the series 2-1. And here you go, the story of the game, Shredhead, Cataphract 3D, 6 damage, Banshee, 1 damage, Banshee, 34 damage. They were just kited and taken down before they could get into the brawl that they were looking for. And after to sum that up, I... I like the concept behind 228's drop deck, I really don't think this was the correct map for it. Those Banshees are going to be running hot, your Jenners are going to be running hot, and there is m too much open ground for you to cross. If that had been Frozen City, if that had been... Hell, even if it had been River City, I think you can bust that out. You can bust it out, get those Banshees in on their face, and just medium pulse chew them apart. Yeah. Alright, uh, my throat is dying once again. I need to get uh, another glass of water. Apologize, guys. It's been a long day of work, plus this, and my, my, my throat is dying. So, I'll be right back, guys. Okay, I am back, and... We are going to settle in for Game 4 and potential match point. This is a best of 5, so Smoke Jaguar, actually at this point, they can either go for the win, or now that they have the match lead, they can actually play for the draw. And if they play for the draw here, it goes 2-1-1. 
and if they play for the draw again, then they just win outright because it's 2-1-2, they have match point. So that's a possibility that's available to them. There are no redrops if there are draws in Arhod. So 2 3 8 has to find some sort of aggressive winning strategy. And they're going to have to do that on, let's check the rotation here. Next up, we have 350 tons. This is a lighter drop weight on uh, HPG Manifold. Caustic is up next. It's hard for me to tell which one it is because I butchered my document with all the cues coming from my push the talk. Uh, so yeah, 350 tons, light drop deck, a bit of flexibility on HPG Manifold. We saw this exact same thing play out last night between Golden Keshik and Swords of Kantaras. Golden Keshik brought four lights armed with ER large lasers. They focused on taking the hill, or rather the wall, and they sat their mediums with sniper ER PPC gauss loadouts just back covering both entrances. And this actually ended up going to a draw because SWK had brought, well, they had brought a full brawl loadout to skirmish on one of the medium to bigger maps. So because of that sort of whoopsie, uh, we ended up seeing a draw. But 2 to 8th, I feel they, they can't play for a draw. And I'm hoping they make the correct drop deck choices to actually have the tools they need to play for the win and break a potential turtle. Now on the flip side, if Clan Smoke Jaguar wanted to do something really insane, they could bring brawlers, bait them in, and counter push it, but I consider that highly unlikely. Murphy's Law is saying that now they're going to be doing it, and I'll just look like an ass. More like an ass. Um, let's bring up the map. Goodbye, Siri face. I'm sorry, chat. Best drawing. Okay. So in pug matches, 95% of your games are going to end up being a fight in the center here. And we're all probably very familiar with how those go. But what we've seen out of teams that are a bit more hesitant about taking that engagement there, and perhaps they just want to uh, play that far standoff style, is so that they instead favor either this A5 area oh, what the shit stupid freaking map tactic lagging out this A5 area because that gives you a long sight line into the entrance here and it gives you a long sight line into B6 here that your opponent is forced to approach from Unless you put a Daishi on the wall. Don't ask me how. Since Daishis don't have jump chats. Uh, or you can set up somewhere back here, anywhere between G2 and G4 is a good spot. And again, that gives you long sight lines basically both ways. G4 is a bit more favorable, because uh, you, even though you're closer to the gate, because the if you were to sit instead left side here, there's this sharp corner that they can use to get close to you. So those, if you're going to turtle, are going to be the two spots. I'm trying to think of anything really to add to that, like beyond 
opening those up as the deep holdout spots. I guess the other factor is that when you're holding out here in these back spots, like we were talking about on F7, like we were talking about, uh, you need an escape route, and this map gives you one. Because if the enemy tries to, uh, coming in after you out of one gate, then you just run for the other gate. And doing a split push on this is really bad because of the massive distances that you have to cross to get into both. As soon as they see the split push coming, they're just going to collapse on whatever is nearest and the biggest threat, wipe it out, and then reverse onto your useless out of the fight guys. So this is going to be a hard one. And, you know, hard reality guys, if I had to say one of these maps was going to go to a draw, which thankfully none of them have yet, it would be this one. But I feel 228 is going to have to put something together. It is a light drop deck. What could we see? Could we see... I suppose we could see something crazy like... Oh, how much tonnage would that be? 130, 220... We could see something crazy like two Gauss Jagermechs and six lights. If you want something that can chase them down, hunt out the legs, while still having some heavies that can blow holes in it from afar. And actually, think about that drop deck, I kind of like it. I kind of like what that would do on this map. Um, problem being that if you do end up in an actual straight-up fight, it's going to be a bit weaker. So, apologies to 228 if I just blew their whole plan. But, um... Yeah, the light drop deck is going to be... You're not really going to get any assaults, and... In the old style, where we didn't know what map we were going to drop on, we on like it was the drop that was considered a coin toss, even against uh, like the best teams, because the conditions are so chaotic, uh, especially in twelve v twelve, when everything on the field is like mediums and lights, and it's just a furball everywhere. And as an aside. This furball was also the one that was most likely to desync the server due to too much laser and MG fire. So in the past like month, month and a half, uh, <laughs> light drop not only was a coin flip for who was going to win, it was a coin flip if you could play it at all. So that's fun. But since the last patch, Carlberg has actually, and the rest of the team, have actually gone a fix in that has greatly reduced the number of MG hit scan related uh, desyncs. Note that this is definitely different from the other desyncs, the just sort of lag out desyncs that have been plaguing us lately, and I really hope those get fixed too. But is there anything to point out about this map? I guess the other big defining feature is just getting on the walls all over through here. You need jump jets to get onto the center ones on that one I just outlined, and the one down here in F4 all along there. And if you can get up there, rest control of that away from your opponent, then you can get some decent poke in. The catch being that the lips of the walls have some pretty annoying invisible walls. Meaning that if you go to peak, you have to go a lot further than would visually expose you just to clear those. And that gives your opponent time to line up the shot. So it can be a bit tricky up there. Or, you know, those times where you, you peek and try to strike an enemy, and it's instead there's red smoke just at your feet, in your face, and you kill yourself. Or, you know, just hurt yourself. But nobody does that, right, guys? Plus, strikes aren't in, aren't in this anyways. Anywho. Let me double-check this. Okay, good. They're not in. They didn't forget to inform me. We are good, guys. We are good. It occurs to me that I actually haven't gone back and talked about the history of Clan Smoke Jaguar. I did a quick one on 228.IBR. Uh, Clan Smoke Dragor, they have members who have played all the way back, like MechWarrior 4, NBT, a couple other leagues back there, made a name for themselves. Uh, they ha this is actually their first foray into serious competition in MWO. 
apparently they hated the sync dropping, they just want to do uh, lobbies, but they are here now and they're making quite a good showing of themselves. They actually are formed of two previous uh, smoke jag units. Um, I want to say it's like Alpha and Beta Galaxy. I'm not up on the like clan sort of lore and which clan units were which. All I know is these guys are CSJ, they're pretty cool. So that, that's probably a bad thing, but I apologize if I can't quote your history ver verbatim. But suffice it to say, they made. They, they do. They are experienced. They have experienced players. Uh, they have experience in the previous Mech Warrior games. And it's showing here in their cohesion and movement is. For a team that hadn't been shown before. They've jumped straight into the Premier Division, so that's, that's pretty good. Pilots you might recognize from them. Energy, Leo, Zaukai Fury, uh, you notice Kotar? Kotari? Kotar? I, I don't even... K-O-T-A-R-E, how do you pronounce that? Mech B, a couple other guys. Some of them... Uh, one of the groups that merged to form this new CSJ... The, several of their members were associated with the Lords, not with their active team, but they... Brain fart. ...were active members of the House of Lords, and I need to stop pressing Q while holding this window because you're getting all these sounds. Sorry. In any case. Suffice it to say, experienced team coming up from various past games against the 228th IBR, who are throwing themselves together for a competition in MWO. And while individual members may have experience in past MW, uh, Mech Warrior games, not as a unit. And they're still. Well, I'd say both teams are still developing into the new meta, but calling it developing, I'm going to be reminded, is a bad thing, because they, they have fought their way into the Premier, and they do still have the potential to pull this back, and I believe in them, or Rafa Waffle will kill me, kick me off the show, and tarnish my reputation in no particular order. So. What can I do until we get this match? This would be a lot of Where's Tribird? I need to pull him in here. Aw, oh, he's AFK. Nothing is happening in chat that I can talk about. I uh, might as well have a look forward at game 5. If this goes to game 5, it's going to be Caustic Valley on... a... 2 light, 3 medium, 2 heavy, 1 assault drop deck. What we saw out of this yesterday when SWK played GK, it was a sudden death game because it was one one win apiece with two draws. Uh, SWK brought a fairly standard sniper lot out with a twist in that they brought a Lerm Shadowhawk, and that Lerm Shadowhawk had top damage on the team. And that was mostly because GK had zero ECM and they had zero AMS. And in that case, I would call that a pretty hardcore drop deck fail. So, Caustic Valley being one of the open maps with no cover and being hot, meaning that your PPCs and your brawlers are going to be running hot, it is one of the prime LRM mechs. And in fact, I'd call it a better, or LRM maps, not mechs a better LRM map than Alpine. Alpine has the long sight lines, but it also has some decent cover that you can drop behind and hide from. And your lights aren't going to be able to get close to drop UAVs because of, and spot for you because of those long sight lines at risk of getting blown up. So, Caustic, best learn map NA. And also EU. Possibly SEA. But thank god I don't have to keep rambling here, because Ralph Waffle is telling me that they are almost ready, quote, less than a minute.
<sighs> okay. So, there will be a cast tomorrow. No, I've got 30 seconds to talk about it. There will be a cast tomorrow of the 228th IBR game versus Steel Jaguar. That's going to be the Losers Bracket semi final for the Invitational. It's going to be a best of seven, and it's going to be cast, at least to, the, to my knowledge, by Heim Delight and Aduvo of the House of Lords because, well, Rafa and I are going to be playing against, against each other in that match. Whoever wins that match is going to be going on to face SWK. Okay, good. My whole friends list flashed. I thought it, I was worried it was uh, 2 8 for a second. But no, it was just SWK and SJR getting a match probably against each other. We're launching in 10 seconds. Um, I'm Delight, Aduvo, casting the 228th IBR versus uh, Steel Jaguar match tomorrow on MW Pro at 6.30 Pacific and 9.30 Eastern. So if you think I'm a shitty caster and you want to see somebody better, tune into that. No pressure, Addy, now. But we are into the game. We have... This clan Smoke Jaguar leading 2 1 against the 2 2 8 IBR. 2 2 8 has to pull this out, and it is HPG at 350 tons, 8v8 skirmish. I wish I had camera control so I could tell you what they brought. I can tell you that Zaokai Fury brought a Blackjack 1. No guarantees on what that's loaded out with. There are some crazy fits you can put onto that with an ERPPC and a Gauss. Oh, look, camera control. And holy shit, guys, it's not two Jagermax and six lights, it's a frickin' Atlas and seven lights. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Let's check if he... Hey, it is kind of white, so it is Snow White and Seven Dwarves, and Snow White is our dearest Raffle Waffle. And they are going up against... Two Blackjacks, two Hunchback, four Peas, lots of lasers, potentially Quad or Large, uh, Shadowhawk 5M, and two embers and a jenner. So five mediums, three lights against one assault and these seven lights here. And now the thing here is that the two two eight lights are aggressively pushing up just to this corner, trying to see what they can find. Hopefully not all peeking at once and revealing what they have. But Pandy's just looking around that corner, trying to see what he can see. And I feel like this attack angle though is going to be kind of bad for them. It's you're going to be crossing 800 meters being fired down at the entire time. I can pretty much guarantee those 4Ps are quad or large. Um, on the other side, CSJ's lights, they're, they're keeping their heads down. They could be getting aggressive, getting up on the wall here, trying to scout and find out what's happening, but they're not. What I'd kind of like to see out of 228th is... I actually think it would be really cool and kind of effective if all their lights got up on the wall ran out along here because if you are down along this edge well no with them up on the wall there or up on the hill rather it is a they can get some mm, meh shots on you but and then you just run out straight at them into the face of all these hunchback 4ps let's just take a quick look and confirm No, those are three are large and three medium, so it's kind of a hybrid. But here we go. 228th is pushing out. They have their seven lights. They're going to be rolling out, uh, trying to take the most cover route. Well, Rafa Waffle in this Atlas is just eating all of the ER large fi laser fire as they rounded the corner. Thankfully, well, not thankfully for 228th, CSJ is swapping off of them, trying to focus down these lights before they can close. Panic button, leader, Jenner D, 78%. Um... He has to be, he has, he should really be starter stepping and not being the first one over, but this is going to turn into a brawl really damn quick. And look at this, Canning Notice, Katarus, Shadowhawk, all seven of those lights on him, 60% being legged. He'll go down quickly. Uh, 228th gets the first kill. 
they're up one zero. Panic button in the Jenner though down the fifty uh, fifty four percent. Two two eight really has to pick the next focus fire and start dropping him, and it seems to be Ring Wraith in the Hunchback. Uh, Panic Button's still not down. He's hanging in there, 45%. Probably, like, Treo... Whoa. Treo Neo just went from, like, healthy to dead. Ring Wraith is almost down. 2 to 8 is ahead on this. With only one light being down, this momentum is going to continue shifting heavily in their favor. Uh, fewer and fewer guns on the field. Too many lights. You can't tell what your focus fire target is. So... It is now 4-2 in favor of 2 to 8. Throw off of Waffles Atlas... Finally taken down, but they don't really care. All that, like, 100 tonners worth of armor, that's just time for their generators to be working their magic. And with only 3 at CSJ left and 6 healthy lights for 2 to 8th, this game is going their way. It's just the 3 lights left, Siberius, Grips, Vigil, and Dario 3, or Dario the 3rd, I don't know, for, for CSJ, and Grips, Vigil is down. 2 lights left against the 6, this is going to be over. That was a baller strat. That was that was frickin' pretty. Ah, uh, and Dario actually picks up a kill on El Decarino, double legging him, but. <laughs> That small consolation isn't enough. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a series. It's 2-2 going into the fifth game on Caustic Valley. Unlikely to be a draw. Caustic Valley isn't big enough. There isn't enough cover to just turtle up. This is going to be good. So. I mean, like, Raffle dying? You don't care. He did his job. Uh, he rounded the corner first, he's getting all these alphas into him, and eventually there was the call to switch off him, but by that point, any damage you wasted on him, you're not getting on those generous closing, and when they're on top of you, circle fighting you, good luck getting a steady burn. And... Three lights against seven, you're not going to be able to save the legs on your mediums. That was fun. No player stats, I earned no money. Actually, if I had earned money, I would have been shocked, but yeah. Ah, uh, so... It's worth it. I'm gonna do a quick... Quick sketch of how that went. It's gonna be like three lines, but... Okay, so for Clan Smoke Jaguar, they did what I was saying and they set up Gulf 3, Gulf 4. Kind of the catch here was that their lights did next to no scouting. They never they never got on the wall, they never uh, looked around and acquired um, any sort of idea about what was coming at them. And Ruffles Atlas got, they positioned it in the near spawn correctly, got it in the wall here. Moved up to here, where the lights were already all staged and staying tight to the wall, so they were hidden. But, I mean, like, if you scout an atlas, you, you gotta do the math and be like, well, there are six or seven lights. It's not like they can have much else in a tonnage of limited drop with an atlas. Um, and just, woo, straight into the face. And, like hunters in Hearthstone, going for the face for the win. That one's for you, Savage. Um... And yeah, Rawful rounds the corner first, eats an alpha, eats a second alpha, doesn't care, it's like a thousand meters, he's not eat, uh, not that much damage going out on him. They switch off, but at that point the lights for um, ba -ba -ba, 2 to 8 are already down in this bowl and they've got some decent cover, then they hop up there in your face, GG. So, that was fun! And quick, and brutal, who says that uh, skirmish matches have to go to 15 minutes. Cough.
Okay. So, next up, the final drop is at two lights, three mediums, two heavies, one assault. So we're not going to see some any any crazy disparities like we did last game. And it's going to be on Caustic. Now we saw this last night. 2 to 8th played an all brawler deck. Uh that was for that was for the invitation. It was 12v12. They brought an all brawler deck against Sig and they won. They won quite handily because uh Sig did Right here, they spawned over on... It was Conquest, so they spawned over on the east side here. They did your standard rotation game. And 2 to eighth just said, Fuck that, we're gonna punch this in the face. They formed up with all their brawlers right here. Sig didn't have the scouting intel. They put, uh, 2 to eighth pushes out on the Theta. And bam, they're right on top with brawlers. So Sig walked right into that. And part of the reason why is because this was Conquest. So they, they had to control Theta. This is sort of the dominant thing that you need map control and conquest. But now here in Skirmish, you have room to sit back. You don't need to be in the center of the map. And so if you bring brawlers on this and your opponent says, well, we're not engaging, then you don't really have any way to close down and force them before you get uh, some kite damage taken. So, as I was mentioning before, the Lerms, Lerms could be a factor here. There's enough weight here that you should have AMS on everything, and you even could sprinkle in some ECM either on your lights, or you could de dedicate one of your medium slots to a Cicada, or actually PPC Cicadas on this map aren't a bad idea, especially it being Skirmish, or less keen on this idea, but you could bring an Atlas DDC. Less keen on it because, like I said, DDC is Brawler, Brawler, this map, Skirmish, bad times. Although, DDC, Lermboat, not the greatest, but you could do it if you just wanted ECM. If you really thought Lerms were going to be something to be concerned about. So, we could see that. But, more likely, we're going to be back to our sort of standard uh, Cataphract and Dragon Slayer loadout. Twist being on this map, Gauss is actually really good. 2 to 8 has a kind of a, a preponderance. Propensity? I think propensity is the right word. In five minutes, you're all going to correct me. They have a propensity for uh, Jager mechs, and so they may bring those back out again. And that wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Unlike Crimson Strait, you're not corner peeking. There are plenty of ridges, and I'm going to highlight... I'm just going to go on a spree and highlight all of these ridges that make Jagermax good. And it's literally going to be like half the map. So bam, you got like the tail in here, you got the entire ring of the caldera, you got uh, down here hills that you can peek over, you got, eh, this hill is not so great, you need jump jets to get on it, but you can do it. And then down here, you've got this entire two line, and you've got F3, and you've got up here. And yeah, that's pretty much it. This 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 side over here is kind of shit uh, for Gauss, but... Any case, point being, Gauss on this is actually better than Crimson. On the flip side, ER Large Lasers are going to be running a lot hotter than they were on Crimson, so that's going to be a disadvantage for them. So, if we see Gauss, wouldn't be surprised in the slightest from 2 to 8. CSJ, well, they've shown that they like to take quick draws in that heavy slot, whether that's going to continue because of that, um, that heat issue is something we'll see. We'll, we'll have to find out. Um, any other factors to consider in this match?
I don't think so. I'm gonna wait on uh, contact from the teams, and I'm gonna take just like a one minute break just so I can rest my voice. It's kind of going right now. Okay, I have word from Rafa Waffle that they are getting green, so we should have this match soon, I should hope. And to Sun Cobra in chat, who is commenting that, quote, The spawns in this map allow Brawler team to engage before snipers can set up comfortably. Yes, that is true in 12v12, and especially if you're trying to take Theta. But I feel that isn't true when it's 8v8, and you can pick to be center and either right or left, therefore closer to your final location and not without a lance that's going to be caught out of position. And two, when it's going to be skirmish and you're playing for all of the cookies and you don't really need to take the center. So, I still feel against brawlers just in general on this map for this mode for 8v8. I'm just going to put a little music on to keep you guys all interested. As soon as I decide whether I want to be a troll or not.
Okay, and we have the match going on, so I will get us in there. And this time, I'll remember to bring it up. On the overlay, instead of, you know, just forgetting. Okay, so in red we have CSJ with, it looks like, Quick Draws and Shadowhawks on their side with some Embers, and I'm going to stop trolling you and actually put, show you the match. Had to do it. <laughs> Alright, and on 2 to eight side we are seeing a Jenner, a Raven, a Misery, and two Jagermax and two Shadowhawks and Wolverine, so there are going to be Gauss Snipers here. The teams have actually selected to spawn on this... Actually, no, I was going to say it was close spawns, but it's actually not. Uh, CSJ is sitting kind of far back in this F3 position with their quick draws. They've got their Shadowhawks over here, a bit closer to where uh, the bases would be, but they are moving over to rejoin F3. And this is kind of the premier defensive spot for their half of the map. Meanwhile, the... 2-8 team, they are kitted out to crack this. They have the Yagamex, they have the Misery, which is going to be two ER PPCs. Well, maybe not two ER PPCs, maybe just one in a peep. I'll check that out in a moment. But it has a Gauss in any case. There's enough Gauss here to crack this turtle with some good sniping. And... Dario the Third in the Ember is over on the left here. He's... It's possible he's going to try and get up here and try and assassinate Panic Button, that's going to be high risk, but he's probably more likely just scouting out. Now his scout position here though, if somebody were to peek over, is kind of exposed. He doesn't have the greatest support from the rest of his team, and that's the other risk, is if he goes to scout the Caldera and everybody's looking at it, then bad times. But Leo and Ringwraith in the quick draws are sitting far back. Uh, however, they've moved up the Dragon Slayers and Shadowhawks to be a little closer here so that they're going to be in range. So it's going to be, it's probably safe to say, yep, looking at those, that's dual AC5. Uh, Shadowhawks here. Shadowhawks here are going to be PPC 2 AC5, just judging by those weapon loadouts there. Rolf and Waffle doing a good job just putting his head up. They're actually winning the trade here. Except so Titanosis and Panic Button are getting caught out on the left here. Dario the third, Trey O'Neill and the two Embers trying to get a bit of work done. And Panic Button's actually committing into this. Um, that's risky if they were to swarm him because his team's all the way over on the right. Let's get a bit up high. There is a UAV up over his position. Can't tell which team put it. Judging by placement, probably CSJ. CSJ is pushing down the three line with those Shadowhawks, with the uh, that Dragon Slayer. And their misery is stuck out on the other side. Panic Button has to get back here. Has to be able to fight it. Um... The two quick draws coming up, riding the ridge on the two line there. I'm going to hop down into uh, first person view just for a moment. Who's got a good position? Pandy is leading the charge in. 2 to 8 is counter pushing, but their misery is going to be stuck out behind. I don't. Only half their team is in on this push. And Pandy's leading the charge. His legs out, his CT's out. He's doing a good job shielding the remaining one. Um. They get the kill on Athesius, can't tell which mech he was, and they're actually better off in terms of position and health, I'd say. But these Yagamex are fragile. Uh, they cannot afford the brawl like that, and they need they kind of need to be second line, like the quick draws were on the other on the other side. I'm gonna keep rotating around here. Can't even notice is the Shadowhawk has managed to pull the most range and therefore is at the least risk. He's going to continue getting out. It's 2-2. Two, two. Uh, full brawl engagement. The two quick draws for uh, CSJ. They're over here in Delta 2. They're not completely committed into this, but they're going to be running hot. I'm going to flip over them. Uh, well, they should be running hot in any case. But and, and so their DPS is going to be lower. Still a complete brawl. 2-8 uh, is arguably ahead, judging by these percentages, but they are down on kills. Grim gets taken out. Uh, Panic Button has the high overwatch position there. Uh, they equalize by taking out Mech B Kotar. It's 3-3 both sides. Shredhead's dropping fast, and Trey O'Neill in, uh, in the Ember is down to 44%. 4-3, CSJ is pulling ahead. Where is Trey O'Neill that he's not dying? 
Wow, just one laser brush on his left torso, and he's out, and he represents quite a bit. There we go, he goes down. It's equaled up, it's... No, it's not equaled up. 228 is down to only three guys. Ed Meester in the light, Panic Button in the misery, and Titanosis in the Jenner. And Titan's trying to commit in, and he's trying to take out these quick draws, because they're almost like, but he's overcommitted here. And he overheats, that's a bad overheat. He's He pays for it, he loses his leg, and he does it again against the Ember when he could have focused down those two quick draws legs. Now it's two quick draws against the Misery and the Raven, as well as at least one Ember and counting notice in a fairly fresh Shadowhawk. 6-4 in favor of uh, CSJ. They're on the back foot, for sure. That Misery alone, when it's getting focused and your opponent is free to watch all the different angles, he's going to have a lot harder time trading. I feel, I feel at this point that that misery lagging behind on the push was really uh, one of the deciding factors that led to this position, uh, because two to eight committed into that push with everything they had, except him. So, seven out of the eight, that's that's not enough DPS like focusing things down. And on top of that, they pushed straight in with the Jagermax, uh, getting him in front line, like, too close to the front, that were easy to focus out, losing out his right torsos. And now, Panic Button's just taking constant fire from multiple angles. They have some shots on him into here. Every single one of his torsos is open. He's landing... He's landing hits, but... It's hard for him to trade at this point. CSJ is just going to play it safe, fall back to this F3 position. They know there's there's no strikes, there's no momentum left on the other team. Uh, it's just Panic Button and Meester fighting a very uphill battle. Literally uphill because this F3 position is higher. Dario feels confident, he's got his right leg, and panic button, his CT is almost out. Machine Gun's just going to work and picking up the kill, Ed Uvo would be proud. All that's left for 228th, Ed Meester and the Raven, he's going to be rocking 2 yard large. He's got some ECM, but he's got the speed, eh, decent at 142.6, but he is... I don't think he wins that fight against the Ember, and the Ember is just fully committed. Not just that, but his range advantage against the quick draws is nil. And can't notice Kotar in the Shadowhawk has shots on him now. So this will just be going from bad to worse. Or like from worse to defeat. Edmisu does a good job, he picks up that right leg, but gets legged in return. Can he kill it? Can he can he pick up the kill on the no, because he's chain firing. If there ever was a time for overheating for glory, that was it. Just throw it out there, see if you have enough alpha to burn that last leg out. Pull it to within three so it looks good on the scoreboard. And speaking of the scoreboard, that's kind of the story of the game here. The two quick draws were over in the two line, uh, just popping that ridge, and 2 to eight could not burn through the... The Victors and the, well, they burned through the Victor and the Shadowhawk really quick, but then it kind of just tapered off from there. Uh, Mech B Kotar took a while to get down. He got 250 out, and Treo Neo got, I think, Freak one shotted by, let's confirm, ye yep, Panic Button, the Stalker probably. And at that point, you're caught out in the open, you got snipers split, uh, right, left, center, right on top of you. Ev Either way you go to engage with your quickly dwindling blob, the other guys are going to have room to reposition, just make it harder and harder for you.
Okay, so with that, Clan Smoke Jaguar takes this best of five, three, two. And this is just regular season, so I was about to say, and moves on to like the finals or something, but it, it's not. This is just regular season play. Uh, we have a 12 week season now with Sig dropping out, so we got eight more weeks of this, and hopefully it continues to be good. Um, what else can I do? Let's draw on the map. So CSJ set up uh, initially, if I can get this, F3, F4. They didn't do a full uh, camp style out on F3. They had guys who were not the full range setup and couldn't be fighting at a thousand because they had AC5s and PPCs. And that was their Dragon Slayers and their Shadowhawks. So they moved those Dragon Slayers and Shadowhawks once they regrouped pretty aggressively up towards uh, Theta. At the same time, they left the Quick Draws on here on F3 to keep poking, keep denying some intel while getting their own. And their lights actually swung out Y to the right. And this is all going to be important for the setup here. 228, on the other hand, had formed up on the stage for their side, this corner, with their, with their Yagamex, and they were trying to trade against primarily the quick draws. Now at this range, uh, between the quick draws set up, between where the Yagamex are, that's still gonna be about a thousand meters. So your Gauss Rifles are doing good damage, they're doing 20 damage, but it's not, it's definitely not max. Now, the kind of the catch here was that their misery was over on this side, and he was getting shots out, but then with these lights coming up, he turned to engage them. Draw, draw please, map tactic. Thank you. He turned to engage them at the same time as uh, the rest of the CSJ team. Their shorter range guys, they slid into three line, and their quick draws, they rolled down, draw, thank you, thank you, down this ridge where they would still have the distance and at any time they could just pop over and pop down if they're getting focused out. Now seeing this move, 228th called for a push straight out into the face of the close range guy saying damn the quick draws, full speed ahead, we're just gonna brawl this down. And again, like I said during the drop, the thing about that is with Jagermax being caught up front, you can't shield their back, their side torsos are easy peasy. You don't really gaining too much by pushing down in three line. So I feel like that might have been sort of a tactical mistake uh, because it allowed their Yagmex to get focused down pretty quickly after the initial Shadowhawk and Pandy was legged and eliminated. But at the same time as this push happened, their misery had only crossed about halfway, work with me, thank you, halfway through the Caldera. So he was late to the fight and six, seven seconds late, I'd say, and that's an alpha or two. And for a brawl, under these light conditions, initial momentum swings, and especially in this case where you have to put down these guys who are up close to you so you can go deal with the kiters, that's kind of a mistake you can't afford. And from there, it just slowly unraveled uh, with CSJ uh, star bursting backwards, getting their, all their mechs just spread out. Draw, why is it so laggy? Spread out all the way, and no matter which way Toothwaith went, there'd be guys the other way who could just fire on them with impunity. Okay. Okay, anyways, with that, we are at the end of the stream. Thank you guys for staying with me. Holy crap, we have 115 people? I haven't even looked since the start of this. Wow. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, wow. Uh, so, CSJ winning 3-2 over 228th IBR. Stay tuned this time, well, sort of same start time tomorrow, 6.30 Pacific, 9.30 Eastern, I don't know what that is, GMT. Let's do quick math. 
it's like 4.30 a.m. GMT. So I don't know why any of you would be crazy enough in the e EU to be watching that, but if you do, awesome. Heimdallite and Aduvo from the House of Lords will be shoutcasting the match here. And that will be the Losers Bracket semi-finals of the Invitational. Winner going on to face SDPK, winner of that going on to face Lords. Shoutouts, shoutouts. I don't have any shoutouts. Shoutouts to devs posting on Twitter and the people who compile it on Reddit, I guess. Because you made my workday pass a little quicker. <laughs> and with that, thank you everyone and good night. Also, Nobody friggin' boot up your stream for five minutes. I need this cooldown timer to go. Wait, actually, it doesn't matter anyways, because you guys are seeing this five minutes in the future. Whatever. I'm so tired. Night, guys.